Hi everyone, welcome to church. I'm glad you're joining us today as we journey once again towards Easter, Easter Sunday. You know it's Easter because all the shopping centers have got their chocolate eggs out. The temptation begins for all of us who have got a sweet tooth and can't resist a little bit of chocolate. Next Sunday, we'll be having our walk in communion once again from half past eight to half past ten. So if you'd like to have communion in person, please come along. Rev Tim will be doing that. But there will also be online communion. So no one will miss out communion. Come along in person or watch from online, but be prepared to have some communion. Paul and Sheila will be leading us in our call to worship. They'll be reading Psalm 29, so I hand over to them. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as King forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Today, we are going to be looking at a problem. A problem that not only affects me, not only affects you, but affects every Christian who has ever lived. This is also a very, very old problem. In fact, this problem is older than the Bible itself. This problem has its roots right in the time of Adam and Eve. And when we read the Bible, we see this problem cropping up throughout the lives of many prophets and priests and just everyone who's involved in their walk with God. And once we have really grappled with and come to understand what this problem is, we will see how influential it is in our lives, how pervasive it is, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. So what is this problem that I am thinking of, that I'm talking about? It's the problem of putting ourselves before God. It's the problem of putting ourselves first and God second. And once we really understand this problem, once we really understand what it means to put ourselves above God, we become aware of how pervasive this really is. The title of this message then is, It's Not About Me, It's About God. So if you're watching this video with someone else, turn to them now and very kindly and lovingly say to them, It's not about you, it's about God. And if you're watching this by yourself, say it to yourself. It's not about me, it's about God. This problem of putting ourselves before God, as I mentioned, started with Adam and Eve. They sinned, they messed up, they disobeyed the command of God. And as soon as they did that, they made things all about themselves. Notice before they sinned, it was about God's presence. It was about walking with God. It was about listening to God. But the moment they sinned, everything became about themselves. They realized they were naked, so they hid themselves. They were ashamed. When God came into the garden to question them, they even hid from God because they didn't want themselves to be exposed. But God sought them out and found them. And when he questioned them, instead of owning up and taking responsibility for what they've done, because the focus was on themselves, 
they try to pass that off by making excuses. God questioned Adam, and Adam said, God, it's not my fault. It's the woman's fault who you put here with me. So maybe it's kind of your fault as well. So he passed the buck on to Eve. And when Eve, when God questioned Eve, Eve said, it's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault. And she passed the responsibility and the blame onto the serpent. And unfortunately, the serpent, being a serpent, didn't have any legs to stand on. I'm sorry, that's a very lame preacher's joke, but I couldn't help but put it in there. I hope you get what I'm saying, though, is that because the focus was on themselves, they made excuses instead of taking responsibility for their own sin and actions. The focus went on be from being on God, who he is, what he does, onto themselves, their own mistakes, their own faults. But it wasn't meant to be like that. It was meant to be all about God. Adam and Eve are not the only people who struggled with this. If we move further along in the story, we see that Moses struggled with this as well. God appeared before Moses, and he gave Moses an instruction. Go to the people of, uh, people of Egypt, go to Pharaoh, and ask him to set my people free. A very clear command from God. But Moses made it all about himself, and here the excuses started to come. Moses started offering up all these reasons about why he couldn't go to Pharaoh to obey God's command. Eventually, running out of excuses, Moses even says to God, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not eloquent enough. Surely, God, you can't be, spending me, can't be sending me to speak to Pharaoh because I'm not a good speaker. Moses made it all about himself, his own abilities, instead of God and God's calling and God's purposes and plans. You see, when Moses made it all about himself, he thought his weaknesses would disqualify him from the calling of God. When it's all about God, our weaknesses have nowhere to stand. But again, it wasn't about Moses. It was about God. It's not about us. It's about him. There are many, many other people in the Bible, many, many other examples I could have used. But I thought I'd just zone in on those two for us this morning. But if you want to do your own study, go read from Genesis all the way through to Revelation and see how many people make it about themselves instead of focusing on God. You see, God is calling each and every one of us. There is not a single Christian who is not called from God. And he's calling us into places, into situations where our weaknesses and our failings and our shortcomings are front and center. And yet that is where he is calling us. And he's calling us there not because of us, but because of him. And it might be that he is calling us into those places because that is where we are weak. And as we know, when we are weak, that is where God is strong. And what I want us to focus on this morning or this evening, whenever you're watching this, is that we need to put God first and focus on him. Because when we put ourselves first, the temptation is going to um, arise to do what Adam and Eve does, did, to pass the responsibility off onto someone else. Or the temptation is going to come from what Moses experienced, to make excuses for why we can't do what God has called us to do. That is where the temptation is. But when we focus on God, when we make it all about him, that is when we step into our calling fully, and nothing, nothing can stop us from fu fulfilling the plans that God has called us to do. So maybe say again to yourself, it's not about me, it's about God. So we have this problem. How do we deal with it though? What can we do to handle it or how do we overcome it? How do we overcome ourselves so that we don't get in the way of what God has called us to do? Fortunately, the Bible doesn't only reveal the problem, it also reveals the solution to the problem. And the solution to this problem is found in Mark 9, verses 2 to 3. And this is all about the transfiguration of Jesus. So let's see what the Bible has to say about this problem. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. Isn't it amazing how many God moments happen on mountains? Mountains seem to be these amazing places where God really interacts and connects with people. If you need a, a good excuse to go hiking, here's the verse for you to use. 
On that mountain we read that there he, Jesus, was transfigured. So the Greek word here used for transfigured is metamorpho, which literally translates to, I guess, metamorphosis or metamorphosis. So Jesus underwent some type of metamorphosis, some kind of change or transfiguration. And we see that change physically in this. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were with Jesus. We see this physical transformation of Jesus in his clothes, and then we see the spiritual transformation in that he met with Elijah, who represents the prophets, and Moses, who represents the law. This amazing transformation. And while this transformation happens, something else occurs. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. So this is obviously a very special, miraculous event that happens. And we don't fully understand what went on there. And maybe we aren't meant to. But this event was so awe-inspiring for Peter that Mark includes in the story that he did not know what to say. Peter was speechless. Can you imagine that? Peter, who always spoke first and then thought second or third or fourth, was speechless. He had nothing more to say. How many times in your life have you encountered something so awe-inspiring that you were left speechless? How many times in your life have you encountered a moment with God that just left you speechless? This event reveals the difference between the earthly human side of Jesus and the godly transfigured size of Jesus. See, the earthly Jesus wore plain clothes. He didn't look remarkable. He didn't own anything. He didn't have a place to sleep or rest. He brought with him love and compassion and mercy. He met the needs of the people and he meets our needs. He brings healing and comfort and peace. That's the earthly Jesus, but that's only one side of him. That's only part of who he is. There's also the transfigured Jesus. His clothes are so white, no bleach could make them that white. He is greater and more powerful than we could ever imagine, that we could ever come to think of. The transfigured Jesus is a Jesus who challenges every understanding we have of him. The transfigured Jesus is so inspiring, so awe-inspiring, so majestic, that we are left speechless in front of him. We must not only know the earthly Jesus who we walk with every day, who ministers to us every day, but we must also know the transfigured Jesus who commands us every day and who we are left speechless in front of and we can say, I can't imagine anything greater than you. It is the transfigured Jesus who answers our problem of how to overcome ourselves. It is the transfigured Jesus who causes us to say, It's really not about me, it's about you. It's not about what I'm going through, it's about how majestic and amazing you are in front of me, God. The transfigured Jesus transforms our understanding of who he is. It transforms our understanding of who we are. And the transfigured Jesus transformed the focus of the disciples. The disciples walked with Jesus every single day of their lives. They heard him preach, they saw him do miracles, They encountered how he lived, and yet they needed an experience with the transfigured Jesus to really open their eyes up to what the bigger picture is. They went from thinking one way to experiencing the transfigured Jesus and thinking a completely different way. And it's the same with us. When we encounter the earthly Jesus, we see, okay, we need to minister to the needs of others. We need to minister to ourselves as well. We've got the church that we want to love and care for. But it's the transfigured Jesus that transforms the focus from us onto him. We stop looking at us and our problems and our affairs, and we start looking at God and his power and his majesty. Our focus goes from me to God. Our focus goes from what do I want to what does God need of me. It's no longer what are my weaknesses and failings and shortcomings. It's now what is God's grace and mercy and strength. That's the change that happens when we encounter 
the transfigured Jesus. Unlike Adam and Eve and Moses, the person who has encountered the transfigured Jesus does not have the option of saying, I can't. That's no longer in their vocabulary. They can only say, because of God, I can. Because it's not about me, it's about God. The focus is not on me and what I can't do. The focus is on God and what he can do. Now, I'm most certainly not saying that we all have the same experience the disciples did. I'm not saying we must go up onto a mountaintop and Jesus is going to appear before us in his white clothes and we're going to have that same experience. I certainly haven't, and I wouldn't bet that I will ever have that experience. But that doesn't mean we can't encounter the transfigured Jesus in different ways. I haven't had that experience the disciples have, but I have encountered the transfigured Jesus. You too will most likely not have that, in, that transfigured Jesus moment, but you too can encounter him in different ways. It's up to you to search and find God, and he will reveal himself to you in the way that is best for you. Well, how can we tell if we have encountered the transfigured Jesus? The person who's encountered the transfigured Jesus obeys what God tells him or her to do. Even though it's scary, even though it's challenging, even though it shakes their knees to the bone, they will obey what God has told them to do. Why? Because they know it's not about them, it's about God. And he's bigger and greater than anything they have experienced. This person takes responsibility for their own weaknesses. This person recognizes that God is bigger and mightier than them. This person is the person that says, it's not about me, it's about God, because I've experienced him fully. And so they obey God and his command to go and do whatever it is that they are called to do. Every area of their life is submitted and ruled by God in this way. They are not free from obstacles, but they have learned to overcome their obstacles because they have learned to put God first. That is the key, is to put God first. And the only way we can put God first is if we have encountered God fully. So the transfigured Jesus helps us to overcome that problem of wanting to put our own issues and problems first because we see who he really is. We see how powerful and amazing Jesus is. And suddenly it doesn't become a p about us anymore. It becomes about God. What does this mean for you, though? What does this message mean for us um, in our lives this week? Well, firstly, this message probably means repentance. It might mean to repent for all those moments in our lives where we have put ourselves first and God second, where we have thought our problems and issues are bigger than God's um, solutions to our problems. For all those moments where we might have thought that we know better than God or we knew better than God, that we knew what God wanted for our lives, we knew better for our lives what God, than what God wanted for our lives. We need to repent from all those times we, we, where we have made that mistake of putting ourselves first and God second. But repentance always leads to greater and better things. And once that repentance has, has happened, we then need to approach Jesus and pray for him to reveal his full might and majesty, that awe-inspiring side of him that leaves us speechless, that overcomes ourselves, and hold on to that Jesus and live every day, every minute, every second with that thought and that purpose that God is bigger than us, that it's not about us, it's about him. It's not about what we are going through, it's about what, call, what God is calling us to do. To so live every second with this knowledge that it's not about me, it's about God. And then we can imagine together right now of what our church, what our community would look like when we all get this right. What would a church be like when every single person is living with God first and themselves second? What would it be like if every single person is so committed to God that the only focus is on what is God doing? What is God saying? Where is God going? How can I follow God? What, are, what would it be like to live in a world where what God says goes, what God commands is done, where God leads, we all follow. We can all joyously pursue God together when we put him first, 
and we put ourselves second. So let's say one last time to those around us, it's not about you, it's about God. And let's say to ourselves, it's not about us, it's about God. Because the transfigured Jesus is the one who transforms our focus, and it's all on him. Amen.